Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch, and in this video I'm going to take a look at Lazy V Grids and Lazy H Grids in Swift UI. We'll cover Lazy V Grids in depth and include the three different grid item types. We'll also include pinned views. All of what you learn here will apply to the Lazy H Grids as well, as you'll see. Now before we dive in, I'd like to remind you that if you enjoy this video, please leave a comment and give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Ring the bell, get notified of new videos. If you enjoy my work and are so inclined to provide some support, you can buy me a coffee. No pressure though. I'll leave a link in the description below. Native support for grids in SwiftUI is finally here. This is made possible by two new views introduced at WWDC 2020, the Lazy V grid and the Lazy H grid. The lazy prefix in lazy v grid and lazy h grid indicates that the views contained in the grid are only rendered when on screen. When they're off screen, they're not part of the view hierarchy. A lazy v grid will place its cells vertically, but arranged in rows. When a row is full, i.e. all columns are used, it'll continue down the next row. Alternatively, a lazy h stack will place cells horizontally in columns. When a column is full, it'll continue to the next column. I've created a starter project for this video and you can download it from the link in the description below. The starter project has five tabs where I'll cover the three different grid item types, the flexible, fixed, and adaptive. And I'll take a look at pin views before finishing with the lazy H grid. Each tab, except for the last, is currently just showing a V-stack of 400 colored rectangles embedded inside a vertical scroll view. We'll be turning the V-stack into a lazy V-grid. The last is an H-stack in a horizontal scroll view that will turn into a lazy H-grid. Each of the colored blocks have been given a specific height, but without a width argument in the frame. In a lazy V-grid, the blocks will be allowed to fill the entire space available to it horizontally. The colored blocks are selected from an array of seven colors that are passed in from the tab view to each of the contained tabs, and I cycle through them using the index and the remainder operator based on the number of items in the colors array. An overlay of the text view is just displaying the index in the array starting at one instead of zero. Each of the tabs has an embed in navigation modifier applied, which is a custom view modifier that I've created. It simply embeds the tab view in a V stack and adds a text view that displays the device's screen width. That view is embedded inside a navigation view. When the view loads or rotates, the, the current screen width is updated. Whether you are using a lazy V grid or a lazy H grid, to make the grids scrollable, they must be wrapped inside a scroll view with the appropriate axis. And this is why I've embedded the original V stack in a scroll view and assigned the axis as vertical. So it appears that we're going to be building a lazy V grid here. So how do you make a lazy V grid and how do you specify the layout of the cells within the grid? Start by changing this V stack to a lazy V grid and we'll see two different initializers. We'll choose the simplest one first as we already have the content. And this is the same content that was in our VStack. We just need to figure out what we need to use for our columns argument. I always recommend when you're learning something new to try and dig down into the documentation. So with that lazy V grid, option click and go directly to the documentation. Then click on the creating a vertical grid initializer. Here we see that the columns are an array of grid item. So let's explore that. Keep going and we'll get an initializer for the grid item that appears to have defaults set for all three of its arguments. The grid item dot size is set as flexible and that's where we're going to start. The spacing is nil and the alignment is nil. I'm curious about this non nil argument, which is the grid item size. So let's drill down on that one, and I see it's an enum representing the three different types of grid items. The default is a flexible one, and that's what we're going to be exploring here. Let me drill down on it, and I'll see that the item has a minimum size of 10 and a maximum of infinity, 
meaning that each good item will have a minimum size of 10, but will expand to fill the entire space left over on the grid row. The size of this item is the size of the grid with spacing and inflexible items removed, divided by the number of flexible items clamped to the provided bounds, i.e. the width of our scroll view. So if we have one grid item, we should have it displayed. Now we know that the columns have to have an array of grid items, so let's start by creating a property titled columns that has one grid item and we'll use all the defaults and not pass any values in and accept the defaults. Then in our initializer for lazy vgrid, we can pass in that argument for columns using our properties array. Hmm, nothing's changed. It appears that a single column flexible size lazy vgrid using the default parameters or arguments is just like a vstack in a scroll view probably a lazy V stack. If we add a second grid item to the array, our grid is now presented in two equally spaced columns. So if we want three columns, we can add another one. We now get a three column grid view, each item with equal widths, occupying the entire width of our device. They are all nicely laid out horizontally and vertically now, with even spacing between them. When I run this on the simulator and rotate, the widths of our content items are equally spaced and again equal width, only wider. If we want to add another column, we can continue to add more columns. But since all of our grid items are the same, we can replace that array with a different initializer for the array that allows us to specify a repeat of an identical element. Let's repeat that grid item four times. Now I could have some fun with this by creating a variable for the count as a state property and use a slider to adjust the number, but I digress. There is another property of the grid item worth looking at, and that's the spacing property. It's optional and the default is nil as we saw when we checked out the documentation, but we do see that there is definitely some space between the grid items. So nil doesn't mean zero. If we want zero space, we can specify that. However, we will need to specify that our grid size type is the default flexible, so that we can then specify a spacing of zero. So what we have right now is equivalent to this. With the grid item type specified, however, we can now add a spacing argument of zero. This removes the spacing between the items altogether. Now, suppose we want to have no space between the rows either. Well, we can do that by adding a spacing argument to our lazy V grid, which will specify the space between the rows. Now, before we move on to the fixed type, let's go back to our original columns and reduce it back to two. I'll keep the default spacing here in. Since the max width of our individual items is set to infinity, the two grid items are going to expand to fill the space equally. We can, however, decide that we want to set the amount of space that our first column will expand to is set. This will require us to specify the flexible size, and we can specify a minimum and maximum. So let's say a minimum of 10, and a maximum of 100 for that first grid item. This will, because we have enough room on our width, expand the first column up to 100, and the second column will take up the remainder. If we run this in the simulator and rotate, you'll see that the first column is always 100, and the second column expands to the rest of the available space because the frame is set to infinity which is the width of our device minus our first item and the space between them. I hope you can see here that with a flexible grid item, you can create various size columns that will adjust to the size of your device. If we add many more columns, you'll see that eventually that first column will start to shrink down to a minimum width of 10. If you really want to fix that width of the first column, 
you could set the minimum to be the same as the maximum. But there really is another type for that, and that's the fixed size grid item, and that's what we'll explore next. In this second tab, let's create our columns property again as an array of grid item, but this time let's add a single grid item that is of type fixed, and let's give it an associated value of 100. Next, change that V stack to a lazy V grid, and we'll pass in that columns array. This time we see a single column of these color blocks, but they're fixed to a width of 100. Let's duplicate it to create a second column of the same size. So now we have two columns centered in the screen and they're equal in width of 100. Now the lazy V stack has the same alignment parameters as a V stack does. So if we want to align this to the leading edge of our scroll view, we can do that for our lazy V grid by adding the alignment property. Not all columns have to be the same width. Let's add a third column, but let's change the width of that first column to 150. I can add multiples of these column types, each with a different width if you like, but you will have to make sure that the total width plus the spaces don't exceed the width of the container, which in my case here is 375 pixels. If we want to remove spacing in the horizontal axis, we do that by changing the spacing in the grid item. So if we want no space between the first and second, we can do that. We can also increase the spacing between the second and the third, so let's add one of 40. Now notice, however, that 150 plus 100 plus 40 plus 100 is equal to 390, and that exceeds the width of my device. So the layout system will be reducing the width of one of these blocks, so be careful. If I run this in the simulator, we'll see the same thing in portrait mode, but if I rotate to landscape, I do get the full dimensions on all three of our columns with a leading alignment. Next up is the third, the really powerful adaptive grid item. Sometimes you want to be able to present as many columns in a row as you can before rolling over to the next row. And the number of columns will vary depending on your screen size. And this is where the adaptive grid item comes in. First, let me change to an iPhone 12 Pro. Not sure why I was at the 11 Pro earlier. It doesn't really matter, but you see here that the width has now gone to 390. The adaptive option allows us to place multiple items in the space of a single flexible column. Let's take a look at the example to understand it better. On this third tab, we can again create our columns property, which is the array of grid items, but this time we'll use a grid item type of adaptive. If you just specify a minimum size, say for example 50, it's going to attempt to fit as many of your grid items in the row, each with a width of 50. So to see how that works, let's change our V stack to a lazy V grid again and add in our columns parameter. On the iPhone 12 Pro, this generates six items in that single column space. Let me run this in the simulator. And when I go to landscape, I see that we get 13. Now, what would happen if we added another adaptive grid item to our column array? For example, let's add a second one, but this time we're going to set a minimum of 100 for the second grid item. If we run this in the simulator, I see I get 3 at 50 pixels and a 1 that appears to be much wider than 100. If I switch to landscape, I get 6 at 50 and 3 more that might be a width of 100. And this is because we haven't specified a maximum width. It's going to expand to occupy the width of that column, which is half of the screen width fitting in as many of those second adaptive items in as possible 
that must have a minimum width of 100. In portrait, that is 1, but in landscape, for that second grid item, we get 3. If I set the maximum width of 120 on that second grid item, you'll see that the width is reduced so that it'll only reach that maximum width. We get 3 at 50 and 1 that is exactly 120. If I run this now in the simulator and switch to landscape, I get 6 at 50 and 3 that are exactly 120. This can be quite confusing, but also very powerful. As with the other two grid items, you can adjust the spacing and that will adjust the number of items that can fit in that column. There's an excellent blog post by the SwiftUI lab that goes into more detail and I'll leave a link in the notes below. There is great power in mixing different types of grid items within your array too. We have looked at the alignment and spacing arguments of the lazy V grid, but there's another one and that's the pinned views and the views to pin to the bounds of the parent scroll view. Currently with lazy vGrids, you can pass in section headers and section footers in an array. It's more difficult to explain than to demonstrate. Let me copy the content of the adaptive view and replace the content of the pin view. Well, what we want to do is to create two sections. The first section will contain the first 20 items and the second section, the remainder. So after the columns property, add the comma and the pinned views argument that will accept an array of pinned scrollable views. These are either section headers or section footers, or both. So I'm just going to start with section headers. Let's start with one. So what we can do is embed the for each loop in a section. And the section can either be a header or a footer. So as I mentioned, we'll choose header. And for the header, it's going to be a text view. And the content itself will be our entire for each loop for now. For the header, I'm going to create a text view. And I'll use the string section 1. If I scroll this now, you'll see the grid scrolls behind our header. This is kind of distracting for me, so I'm going to fix this up a bit by giving our header a font of title. I'm going to provide a frame that will expand the view to cover the entire grid, so I'll set a max width property of infinity. I'm also going to give it a background color that will be the same as the system background. Now when you scroll, the header is a solid bar. Now it doesn't make sense to have only one section, so let me copy this first section and paste it below. In the first section, I'll change the for each loop to go from 1 up and to 21. And for the second section, we'll change the text to say section 2, and then we'll start at 21, going up to 401. Now you can see that our grid has two sections, and as I scroll, the section header is pinned to the section. If you want to add footers, you can do that by adding a section footer to the array, and then add your footers at the end of your section before starting the next section. For content, I'm just going to have an empty closure. And now you can see that the footer is pinned to this first section. Now I chose a color of system background for my header text because when I run this in the simulator, I can switch to dark mode. And you'll see that the headers blend in nicely. Well, that's pretty much it for the introduction to lazy V grids. But before I leave you, we have to discuss the lazy H grid. Lazy H grids function exactly the same way as lazy V grids do, just with an access rotation. Columns become rows, and you adjust the height rather than the width. Notice that the scroll view is set to horizontal for this H stack. So let's convert this to a lazy H grid.
So for example, if you want to display as many as 50 pixel high color frames down the screen as possible and scroll horizontally until you view all 400, you can do it this way. First, we'll define a property called rows instead of columns, and it too will be an array of grid item, and we'll create a single adaptive grid item, and we'll set the minimum width to 50, just as we had done for our first lazy V stack that used the adaptive item. We'll change the H stack to a lazy H grid, and we'll pass in our rows. This time the items are populated vertically, and then start again at the top and continue in this manner. And we can continue to scroll to the right until all 400 have been displayed. Everything that we learned for lazy V grids apply to lazy H grids as well. You're just changing the axis. So I hope you found this video useful and will be able to start implementing lazy H grids and lazy V grids within your own projects.